Hey guys, Tyler here. If you're a fan of Star Trek, you're almost certainly familiar with the franchise's primary method of faster than light travel, warp drive. But there's another term that many fans will probably be familiar with. Transwarp. This describes various technologies that allow for speeds exceeding traditional warp drive limits. And if you've watched Star Trek, you know there are a bunch of different flavors of transwarp used by different species. So imagine my surprise when watching the third season of Star Trek Discovery, which brings the titular ship and her crew from the 23rd to 32nd century, when everyone in the galaxy is still seemingly dependent on regular warp drives and dilithium. Indeed, it's this very dependency on dilithium that, in part, has contributed to one of the most cataclysmic events in galactic history, the burn, which rendered FTL impractical for over a century. In this video, I'd like to catalog the various FTL methods besides warp in Star Trek and determine why they didn't replace warp drive by the year 3189. Did Discovery's writers just forget about them, or is there something else at play? Let's find out. First off, a little refresher on warp drives in case you aren't as well versed in Trek's technobabble. I made a video exclusively focusing on the science of warp drives last year. Link in the description. Long story short, most conventional warp drives run on a matter-antimatter reaction regulated by dilithium crystals. These naturally occurring crystals are relatively rare, but moreover, they cannot be synthesized or replicated. That said, the lifespan of dilithium deteriorated through usage in warp cores could at least be extended via a recrystallization matrix. As for the burn itself, it was an enigmatic disaster that took place throughout most of the Milky Way, circa the year 3069. Nice. Within a single moment, most refined dilithium mysteriously turned inert, thus causing any ship, station, or facility with an active warp reactor to suddenly lose antimatter containment. This immediately caused countless warp core breaches, instantly killing millions. Afterwards, dilithium became even rarer and far more valuable as a consequence, which subsequently destabilized the galaxy even further. In comes the hero ship, the Crossfield class USS Discovery, with her experimental Displacement Activated Spore Hub Drive, or Spore Drive for short. This utilizes mycelium spores to instantly jump through one of the many subspace domains called the Mycelial Network. The Mycelial Network is like Mycelial Network to any pre-selected point in the galaxy. While this project was disowned, buried, and classified in 2258, Discovery's crew would reintroduce the tech to the galaxy by traveling 931 years into the future, sacrificing their social and family lives and their future. Life in Starfleet can be pretty demanding. Now, on to the various types of alternative faster-than-light methods. In 2153, in the wake of the Zindi attack on Earth, Starfleet learns of the existence of the subspace vortex, capable of transporting a vessel at a rate of about three light years per minute. The vortices through subspace are opened and maintained via a phase deflector pulse and are sustainable for up to hours at a time. This method is centuries ahead of what United Earth and other local space powers possess in the 2150s, and on top of that, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, for them to track a starship traveling through this kind of artificial vortex. We know from Enterprise that by the 26th century of a possible future, the Zindi are members of the Federation. So why couldn't Starfleet have gotten their hands on subspace vortex technology by the 31st century? Well, as it turns out, it's not so much an issue with the tech or its accessibility, but with subspace itself. In Discovery's Season 3 opener, Cleveland Booker indirectly suggests that by 3188, there is probably something wrong with subspace throughout the galaxy. He berates Michael Burnham for inadvertently destroying a large swath of the domain, owing to her precipitous arrival via a space-time anomaly. A similar method of generating an artificial wormhole, based on theories by Trill scientist Dr. Lenara Khan, is tested using the USS Defiant in 2371, but the wormhole collapses 
within minutes. It's unclear if any other associated research led to anything practical over the centuries. And yet another one of the major transwarp drives depicted in the 24th century time frame is called Quantum Slipstream Drive. Invented by Borg-designated Species 116, it uses a ship's deflector to focus an energy beam that forms an artificial quantum field, enabling a spacecraft to penetrate the quantum barrier and travel through the so-called slipstream. In order to maintain the slipstream, the phase variance of the field must be constantly computed and adjusted. This makes quantum slipstream much more hazardous to operate, owing to its greater requirement for processing power and susceptibility to overheating and failure. The most efficient way to regulate this is using benamite crystals, but unfortunately, like dilithium, these are incredibly rare. Without benamite, Voyager managed to traverse 300 light years in one hour and more than 30 times faster with the crystals installed. Even in Discovery, Book says he would gladly use Quantum Slipstream if he had access to any Benamite. In the original series episode by any other name, which takes place in 2268, several surviving members of the non-humanoid shape-shifting Kelvins from the Andromeda Galaxy temporarily hijack Kirk's Enterprise. Having previously been marooned on an M-class planet within local space after their generational ship was destroyed by the Milky Way's galactic barrier, their newest objective was to return to their homeworld 2.5 million light years across the extragalactic void within three centuries. For comparison, a 2260s Constitution class ship running constantly at maximum warp Warp 9 on the old scale would take more than 10 times as long to complete the journey. For a galaxy-class starship, about four times. Obviously, the Kelvin's technology was way too advanced for the Federation to successfully reverse engineer it, and the applied modifications have apparently never been replicated, unless... Besides, this is exactly that a modification of existing dilithium-regulated warp power. As for proper transwarp drives, well, transwarp is still an umbrella term. For any engine that can cheat its way past the supposedly unbreakable warp 10 barrier. Over the centuries, some proven technologies, as well as some theoretical technologies, have had the moniker applied to them. One such project is nicknamed the Great Experiment and debuts in the form of the Excelsior class in 2285, with prototype NX2000 seen in the search for Spock. Its transwarp drive utilizes a combination of an enhanced warp engine and transporter field matrix to enable the desired speeds. However, Starfleet could never make this drive work properly, since the dilithium in the warp cores always became dangerously unstable and the whole project was scrapped in 2287. Speaking of warp 10 and 2372, Tom Paris outfits a Type 9 shuttlecraft, christened the Cochrane, and briefly surpasses warp 10, but it has some rather slimy side effects. The Delta Quadrant's Saurian Hermits, the Voth, pioneered their own kind of transwarp some 77,000 years ago, according to Beta Canon. But besides this and Excelsior, when most people think about transwarp in general, they more often than not think of the Borg transwarp drive. Superficially similar to the subspace vortex and quantum slipstream, this drive creates a tunnel through subspace called a transwarp conduit, inside which regular subspace variables do not apply, thus allowing a vessel to achieve extraordinary velocities otherwise impossible in normal subspace. This drive's principle is heavily based around the exploitation of tachyons, theoretical subatomic particles that naturally travel faster than light. Depending on a vessel's size, this type of propulsion requires at least three major components to work in unison, deflector shields, a traditional warp drive augmented with a transwarp coil, and a navigational deflector that emits tachyon bursts to modify the warp drive produced subspace field. Starfleet officially became aware of this technology in 2369 thanks to the exploits of the Enterprise D crew. Unofficially, however, humans managed to salvage remnants of a transwarp coil more than two centuries earlier from a time traveling Borg sphere, though soon after the device likely got confiscated by Section 31. Mm -hmm. 
what you say mm, that it's all for the best the borg collective ran a vast network of thousands of pre-established transwarp conduits traveling through which was faster, safer, and far less energy consuming than digging one from scratch. Being even larger than the already colossal Hirogen Relay Network, it spanned a huge portion of the Milky Way galaxy, with exits in all four quadrants. The network was maintained via countless interspecial manifolds, interspersed throughout the conduits, and via megastructures called transwarp hubs. However, this network is mostly destroyed in 2378, as seen in the Voyager finale Endgame, though parts of it remain intact as of 2399. We learn in Discovery Season 3 that there are still pre-existing conduits by 3189, but usage of them bears some serious risks, and maintaining them is a serious challenge, as seen from the hordes of debris seen in one in There is a Tide. The naturally occurring subspace corridors of Underspace, discovered by the Vadoir in the 6th century and lost to the Tere 900 years later, operates on a similar principle but is rather inconsequential given its location. That said, I still thought it was worth a mention. On a number of occasions, we've seen ships hurled across vast distances of space using both technological and seemingly godlike methods. In 2267, the Metrons hurled the Enterprise near instantaneously 1,630 light years away from Metron space, seemingly through just sheer willpower. Such a super advanced level of tech could hardly be equaled by the vast majority of corporeal intelligent beings in the 23rd or 32nd centuries. In 2364, during warp engine tests of the Enterprise D, the Traveler propels the vessel over 2.7 million light years to the Triangulum Galaxy, then inadvertently billions of light years within minutes to the so-called end of the universe, whatever that means where the essence of thought becomes reality. In a manner similar to the Metrons, the Traveler achieves all of this through the power of his mind, though he must still work in concert with Warp Drive. Later in 2364, the reclusive Aldeans, on certain levels more technologically advanced than the Federation by several centuries, hurl the Enterprise 12 light years away from their planet within just 10 seconds using a repulsor beam. Given its name, it's possible this is an evolution of anti-grav tech, though it's unknown if any other local space powers tried to replicate it over the subsequent eight centuries. Nevertheless, even if the Aldeans had offered the tech to Starfleet, they likely would not have accepted it due to the Prime Directive. The USS Voyager encounters a similar technology, the Graviton Catapult, though this relies on a large pre-built facility and uses null space, which does not intertwine uniformly with local space. Plus, the length of individual jumps are rather difficult to precisely estimate in advance, being dependent on a spacecraft's mass, its geometry, etc. In 2365, the near-omnipotent being known as Q decides to teach the complacent Starfleet a lesson by hurling the Enterprise 7,000 light-years into uncharted space to meet the Borg for the first time. Asterisk, again in a matter of seconds. Once again, he does this with the power of his mind, which at this point should be clear is a technology indistinguishable from magic, as Arthur C. Clarke would put it. And then in 2367, the highly advanced Scytherians bring the Enterprise to them remotely by upgrading Lieutenant Reginald Barclay's mind to regenerate a highly charged graviton field and create a powerful subspace distortion. This hurls the ship over 30,000 light years to the galactic core in a matter of seconds. Later on, Picard states in his log entry, After 10 days in the company of the Scytherians, the Enterprise has been safely returned to Federation space. We bring back knowledge of their race that will take our scholars decades to examine. Apparently, as the future has told us, all that valuable knowledge does not include how to recreate the controlled subspace distortion, which could forever revolutionize space travel in the entire galaxy. <laughs> 
Voyager introduces us to the extragalactic Nassine species, an intelligent non-humanoid race composed of sporocystian energy. Their native realm, called Exotia, is one of the many layers of subspace. A group of Nassine were compelled to leave for normal space, exploring for millennia before settling near the planet Ocampa towards the end of the 9th century. Two of the Nassine, who were companions, parted ways in the mid-21st century. By then, they were already known as its caretaker and Suspiria. In 2371, in a last-ditch attempt to find a new compatible mate, the dying caretaker generates displacement waves to haphazardly bring dozens of starships from across the Milky Way to the Delta Quadrant. In the case of Voyager and the Maquis Val Jean, the journey of staggering 75,000 light years lasted for only two minutes. The displacement wave is characterized by a polarized magnetic variation, which may or may not be roughly analogous to the shifting of magnetic poles via the application of an external magnetic field. In layman's terms, Voyager and the like got brutally sucked by a sudden tremendous force through most of the galaxy, sustained extensive damage damage and lost several crew members in the process. This only showed how immensely impractical this FTL method would be for regular carbon-based species. Some civilizations use ultra-long-range transporter technology, which can beam individuals up to tens of thousands of light years. One instance is the Sicarians, as seen in Voyager's Prime Factors, folding space using anti-neutrinos and a tetrahedral quartz for both focusing and as an amplifier. Unfortunately, as of 2371, this spatial trajector matrix is incompatible with the Federation's tech. The Benthan invented coaxial warp drive functions similarly, drawing in subatomic particles and reconfiguring their internal geometries. But it's unclear if Starfleet or any other local space power ever attempted to develop their own in the eight centuries following Voyager's return. Spatial displacement allows a vessel to phase through the space-time continuum to travel up to 90 light years, though the isolationist Voth aren't up for sharing. Discovered by Starfleet in 2365, the Iconian Gateway is another technology developed by the ancient Iconians some 200,000 years ago, whose underlying principles remain well beyond the comprehension of Federation science. This pangalactic network allows for instantaneous travel over vast distances, at least up to 70,000 light years. The geodesic fold encountered by Voyager in 2377 is a a more temporary version of the gateways, utilizing the magnetic field of a red giant star and a Verderon beam, another FTL-capable particle, though this method causes intense levels of radiation. Similarly, the molecular transporter, originally possessed by the now-extinct Kalandans, is capable of transporting objects as large as a starship in a matter of seconds, up to nearly a thousand light years. In the original series episode, The Empath, the Vians of Minara have progressed past the point for needing traditional spacecraft, transporting the entire population of a planet across interstellar distances. In fact, this manner of travel was actually one of Gene Roddenberry's visions for the future of mankind, that we'd simply outgrow conventional spacecraft. Star Trek Into Darkness, anyone? <sighs> that was a pretty exhaustive list, which I hope that you guys enjoyed all the way. All the way. Actually, there are a few more that I haven't mentioned yet. The proto-warp introduced in Star Trek Prodigy that uses an artificial baby sun to propel ships at fast speeds. But this still uses dilithium. The episode Relativity introduces the temporal displacement drive, which allows a ship or even a person to travel to virtually any point in space or time. But shortly after the end of the temporal wars in the mid-31st century, all known time travel technology were banned and destroyed. There are also quite a few other super-fast warp engines encountered by the Enterprise in TOS and TNG. But back to the issue at hand, were any of these options in the 32nd century after the burn? We know that both quantum slipstream and transwarp are technically available, but they don't really solve the dilithium dilemma. 
of the other options listed above, coaxial warp drive seems to be the most plausible as a post-warp propulsion method, but presumably there is some technical reason that it couldn't be implemented en masse by Starfleet and others. There is one other issue at play that some of you might have already thought about. Nearly all of the FTL methods mentioned here originate from the 24th century or earlier, yet rationally one would think that in the 800 years since, someone would have invented something better. So why didn't they? It's possible that no one felt the need to innovate, with warp drive, transwarp, and quantum slipstream seeming good enough to reliably serve for centuries. The truth is, we do have some analogs of this in our real world today. The internal combustion engine, by far the most common power source for motorized vehicles, was invented in 1794. We've since refined this technology, yes, but Although we possess many cheaper and cleaner technologies, such as fully electric engines, for a multitude of reasons, the internal combustion engine still dominates the automotive industry, among other industries. Another example directly related to space travel is the bell-shaped propelling nozzles on rockets. First used by Robert Goddard in 1926, they're still used today by Blue Origin, ESA, NASA, SpaceX, etc despite the existence of newer, more efficient successors like the plug nozzle, CERN, and mainly aerospikes, which were developed over two decades ago. So why is that? Well, virtually all the bugs concerning conventional exhausts have been more or less eliminated over the past century, and the infrastructure around them is very well established. It's a classic case of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Then again, this kind of rationale could lead to complacency in the future, which could then lead to a cascade of severe problems, much like what happened in the Star Trek universe. By the mid-30th century, most known dilithium deposits within the Milky Way were already becoming depleted, and only then did galactic society wake up and begin properly focusing on new alternative FTL modes. Many failed to materialize as viable for widespread use, though one highly promising project did emerge, denoted SB-19, developed by the Vulcans and Romulans of Navarre. SB-19 would have allowed starships to be transported across thousands of light years in an instant without the need for dilithium. Unfortunately, it was concluded SB-19 could be too dangerous, likely for its potential for tampering with the realm of subspace. The big irony of all of this is that if the Federation had not sent a Kelpian research vessel to discover new dilithium nurseries, she would have never crash-landed on Theta Zeta, Sukal would have never mutated, and the cataclysm of the burn would never have happened. There's a pretty major moral and allegorical warning behind this. The obvious parallel between dilithium and crude oil, the latter of which being a constantly dwindling resource we should take care to transition away from before it's too late. Oh, and one more thing I forgot to mention, something that a lot of you have been probably waiting for me to talk about. What about the Romulan Singularity Drive? You know, the one that uses an artificial black hole to power various types of warbirds. Well, in addition to the extreme risks behind such a drive, it's never been established that Romulan warp cores don't still use dilithium. The Star Empire runs dilithium mines on Remus, so given their historically isolationist nature, they've got to be using it for something. In any event, I have a whole video about the Romulan Singularity Drive, which you should check out, link in the description. All in all, the major point that I wanted to make with this video is that even though it seems like across the centuries of Star Trek's history, someone should have come up with a better solution to implement following the burn, sometimes change isn't considered necessary or even welcome, or comes too late. In any event, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. 
I just want to give a quick shout out to all my donors who allow me to bring on outside talent like editors to help deliver more high quality content for you to enjoy. By becoming a patron or member, you also get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal as well as my social media and merch store are in the description too. That's all I have for this year. Live long and prosper. Do I look alright?